Today we're sitting with the Dr. Mordechai Kedar um, to ask him about what's going on in Middle East. Uh, basic facts that we want to share with us to European political leaders, decision makers, opinion makers, to actually give them the, the real perception of what's going on in Israel, in Middle East, and the geopolitical circumstances that European leaders should be aware of. So, first and foremost, shalom and good day, My Dr. Pleasure. Mordechai Kedar. It's an honor to sit here with you. My pleasure. In Ranana, in Israel, and uh, we are grateful to have you here. Um, I would first ask you to present you to our audience. Who are who is Dr. Mordechai Kedar, and well, what are you doing? Well, I, I was born in Tel Aviv 61 years ago. I grew up as a child here in Israel, and I was attracted by a very good teacher of Arabic to study Arabic in the high school. And uh, with a group of like 13 kids, we learned Arabic very, very well. And we went to the army after uh, we finished high school to the intelligence corps. And I was there for 25 years dealing with the Arabic in general in professions which needed Arabic. And, and when I got out of the army in 1995, I joined Barilan as a research place and teaching place. And until today, I am a professor or doctor and teacher at Barilan, researcher in Besser Center, Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. And now I'm the director of another center for the study of the Middle East and Islam, which is under formation. Uh, at Barilan as well, in addition to other organizations and positions in the different places. In addition, I uh, am a commentator on the Middle East to some Israeli newspapers. And regularly I write in these newspapers this commentary about the Middle East. And you've been serving as well in the Israeli Defense Forces? Yes, I was there for 25 years between 1970 and 1995. And uh, in a way, I continue in Miloim, in reserve service, as an advisor. Perfect. And uh, tell us more about the, the, the current situation in Middle East, since we have uh, extremely limited access and, and restrictions in Europe when it comes to the media coverage of the topic of, of Israel and the so-called Palestinian issues. Um, what is going on right now? What should we know about this situation in the Middle East? Well, uh, the, you have to make a very big difference between the Middle East at large and Israel and the Palestinians. Israel and Palestinians is one small problem of the Middle East. The Middle East, which is all the way from Morocco in the west to Iran in the east, from Turkey in the north to Yemen in the south, is a swamp of problems, of wars, bloodshed in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Jordan, in, uh, um, uh, in Egypt, in Libya, big time. Uh, formerly we had a civil war in Lebanon, we had it also in uh, Algeria. There is a war between Morocco and the Western Sahara, uh, inside Sudan, Darfur, uh, the southern Sudan, uh, there is almost no Arab country without problems. Even Iran domestically suffers from insurgency of the Baloch in the southeast and the Kurds in the northwest. Turkey has big problems with the Kurds, which recently uh, got better. But there are so many wars and bloodshed and problems all over the Middle East, and all of them are regardless of Israel and Palestinians. The, the war between the Sunnah and the Shia, which is already 14 centuries, which we see today inside Iraq and in other places. The war in Syria has nothing to do with Israel. The same thing with Libya and Algeria and Yemen and Sudan. And all these wars and bloodshed, mass bloodshed, has absolutely whatsoever no connection to the problem between Israel and the Palestinians. Even if Israel makes peace tomorrow, yesterday, with the Palestinians, it will solve no problem hmm. in, the, in, the, in, in the Middle East. And not only this, if, even if Israel evaporates, 
if there will be no Israel. Imagine a world without Israel. So what? The Sunnis will start kissing the Shias and, and the Kurds will love the Arabs and the tribes in Libya will sit around one fire and sing Kumbaya together. These are dreams. Mm. And, and, and this is the, and, and, and this, the reality of the Middle East is, is this region is sinking in so many wars and bloodshed, some of them because of uh, European greedy greed to the oil as it is in Libya, or to sell weapons mm. to all the sides and make good money. And in, in addition to chemical mm. uh, um, materials, which also accelerate problems in Middle East, like in Syria and in Iran, or technology, European technology, which goes to Iran uh, uh, for many years already. So definitely, you, Europe, I would say, makes living to extend on the because of the problems in the Middle East. Mm. And it's unfortunate that the bloodshed in the Middle East fuels the American, the the. The, the European economy. Mm. And this is what the problem is. It's not Israel makes the problems. Mm. I think that the Europeans are involved in way much more bloodshed in the Middle East mm. than Israel. Because European weapons are almost everywhere in the Middle East. So basically we could pinpoint out that the common terms that we actually see and the transformation we have in the so-called Arab Spring uh, from a so-called peace aspiration to Islamic radicalization, is that the way we're going to? Or it's, it's not only Islamic radicalization; it's also fragmentation of the countries, mm. of the states. You see, states are divided. Iraq is divided in an Arab state and a Kurdish state. Not officially, but factually, it is divided. And, and Sudan was divided officially, and now both sides are uh, having domestic big problems. Uh, Yemen is going to be fragmented mm -hmm. to states like in the United States of America or Germany. Um, and, and, and Syria mm -hmm. is falling apart. Mm -hmm. To talk today about Syria is just like to talk about Yugoslavia mm -hmm. or Czechoslovakia or the Soviet Union. These are all past. Mm -hmm. We have today new states which came out from the ruins of those former states. The same thing without, is with Syria. Mm -hmm. Syria will never return to be a consolidated state under one regime. It is gone. The Kurds will never be, be under, the, uh, under the Arab rule because they don't love Arabs. Mm -hmm. And Arabs don't love Kurds as well. Mm -hmm. The Middle East now actually goes to the natural situation. The natural situation of the Middle East is that people live in a traditional framework of the tribe, ethnic group, religious group, mm -hmm. or sectarian group, like Sunni Shi. Uh, conglomerates like Iraq, which had so many tribes and ethnic groups like Kurds and Arabs and Turks and Persians, and religions, mm -hmm. most, uh, Muslims and Christians and Jews and Sabais and Mandays and Zoroastrians, ten religions only in Iraq, and sects. Sunni, Shia, Christian uh, denominations, it never worked because this was an artificial state which never succeeded to set in the hearts of the people and to replace the loyalty mm. of the people from being loyal to the tribe or the ethnic group or the religious group or the, or the, or, or the sectarian group to be loyal to the state, mm. to be Iraqi mm. or Syrian or Yemenite, or Libyan. Mm. People remained loyal to the tribe mm. and to the group, and they kept fighting each other. Mm. This is why they needed a dictator mm. all those years in order to consolidate them, uh, in order to hush them, in order to push them all into one bottle mm. and not to open, uh, uh, to open it ever. So this was actually a barrel of explosives. Mm. What happened today in the Arab world, uh, this barrel is, is exploding and the states are imploding mm. and fragmented and this actual to see what we should do what the world should do mm. should support this this process and to uh, 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 help those people to create homogeneous states mm. which has which have prospects to be normal states like the gulf mm. states which are stable not because of the oil dubai has no oil 
And on the other side, Iraq and Libya have much oil, and this doesn't contribute to the stability. Mm -hmm. What makes the stability in the Gulf, and I exclude Bahrain, talking about Kuwait and Qatar and the seven Emirates of the Union, they are stable because every one of them is one single tribe. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you have one single tribe in the Middle East, mm -hmm. It lives within itself. Mm. The leadership is, is, legit, is legitimate. The state is legitimate. Nobody shakes the boat. And everybody obeys because everybody is part of the tribe. Mm. But if you merge them together, mm. they kill each other. Could we actually find, identify the, the, the common pattern within the so-called Palestinian society? Definitely. Mm. There are tribes as well. Mm. And look, and there are five tribes in Hebron, mm. the city of Hebron. Jabri, Kawasmi, Abu Sdena, Natche, and Tamini. Um, uh, another tribe is Jericho, like the Arikat. Uh, another tribe is in, in uh, Ramallah, Barhuti. Another tri uh, three tribes in, in Shechem, in, uh, in uh, Nablus, uh, Masri, Tukan, Shaka, uh, Tulkarem, the Karmis. So definitely, th this is, these are, there are also tribal societies, and this is why I think that the only solution is to create the Palestinian Emirates. Mm. Already we have one in Gaza, which works already for seven years. In June two, uh, two, uh, 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 two, 2014, it will be already seven years mm. that this state functions mm. with the government, with borders, with uh, ministries, with the judicial system, with education system with economic system, mm. with military, with the police. This is a state, mm. although it didn't declare statehood. But Gaza is a state, and we have to recognize mm. the fact that Gaza is a state. And in addition to this, we have to continue to create Palestinian Emirates. Mm. By the way, there is a website, palestinianemirates.com, mm. which I created in order to promote this idea. And therefore, we, we need a, an emirate for the tribes of Hebron, another emirate for the tribe of uh, of Jericho, another one from Ramallah, uh, uh, Nablus, Jenin, Carmen, Kalkilia, the cities, while Israel should forever remain in the rural areas in order to make sure that this will never become another Hamastan, mm. which we have in, uh, in, in Gaza. We learned the lesson. And this way, something almost like 90% of the Palestinian population will be liberated from Israel and Israel will have security mm. by ensuring that there is no another Hamas state because neither Israel nor the world needs another Islamic terror state and nobody in the world, even in Europe, nobody has a guarantee mm. that a Palestinian state will never turn into another Hamas mm. after Hamas already won the elections of the Palestinian Legislative Council mm -hmm. and until today they have the majority uh, which they won in January 2006 mm -hmm. and they took Gaza by force in June 2007. Mm -hmm. Who can guarantee that this scenario will not repeat itself in the West Bank? Mm -hmm. So what, is, what a normal state will allow another uh, Islamic terror state mm -hmm. uh, be being established on its border uh, when we are so vulnerable and uh, under the mountains where, where they are look, looking over us. So uh, this is, I think, the only solution which will bring peace and will liberate the Palestinians from Israel, or most of them uh, at least, from Israel. And this is the only way how to bridge between their willing to be independent and Israel's needs of uh, uh, of uh, security. Mm. By the way, it has also a very solid legal uh, basis because as people try to ignore the League of Nations in the San Remo Convention uh, gave the Jewish nation the land of Palestine. Not any other nation is mentioned in that decision. You can read the decision in clear English and it's well known and it's fait accompli. Mm. The Jewish people received from the League of Nations, from the international family, the land of Israel, only the, the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So definitely we have the uh, legal basis why 
we can, on our soil, establish these seven uh, Palestinian Emirates if they don't want to live with us. Uh, we don't have to chase them out. We don't have to abuse the rights. And Emirates can flourish mm. as they do in the Gulf. And again, it's not because of the oil. Mm. It's because it's the stability, social stability, which is the outcome of the one tribe mm. state. And on the social stability, you can have a political stability. And on political stability, you can have a, a, a flourishing economy as there is in the Gulf. So let's uh, just focus a, a bit on the, the European context when it comes to the case of Israel. Uh, how could we affect the European political leaders to, to renew and to, to re-understand the, the, their perception regarding Israel? Since we have a lot of misunderstandings, we have a lot of deceptive perception about Israel, uh, the, the media concentration about the fixation from the media to de delegitimize the state of Israel, to demonize the state of Israel. What shall we bring to back to Europe? Well, first we have to understand uh, where it comes from. Mm. Israel is a nation state mm. of the Jewish nation. Europe today, or European states, nation states, like France, Sweden, give up to a large extent mm. the national nature mm. of the nation state by allowing almost free immigration of other from other cultures, by depicting nationalism as Nazism, mm. and by creating this idea that all all everybody has the right to do whatever he likes, to move from every country to every country, to do whatever he likes, you know, like internationalism rather than nationalism. And this is the atmosphere in the last, let's say, 20 years in Europe, which largely accepted by most Europeans. And the nation state actually finished its role, and now we all have to unite everything, to unite the currency, to erase the borders, we can go from where we're like, oh, we can invite whoever goes on in the world. If we need the foreign workers, let the whole world come to us, it's okay. We give up on our land and our culture and our characteristics because it's nice. Because, and you can see it very well in many, many uh, aspects. Israel is a nation state which tries to keep its nationhood. Because we are a small nation, only Jew, we are only 13 or 14 million in the whole world mm. with Jews. And we want to keep the little country which we have as a nation state. And we don't give up on our character and our nature as a Jewish state. Uh, so Europeans do not like it. Because we apparently succeed to be a nation state mm. where they failed mm. to preserve their nation. They envy us. And they don't like us. They want we. They don't want us to join the stream, to join the crowd of those nations which gave up on their nation. This is why Jewish state is sounds like parochialism or extremism or something which remained in the 19th century of the of the nationality. No, we are modern today. We are open. We gave up. We don't need the nationalism anymore. Nationally brought us to the Second World War. We don't want it anymore. Be nice, be kind, invite everybody. Okay, this is a, I, I think it's new communism, a new kind of communism, which um, uh, uh, one of the cornerstones was fraternity of nations, as we saw. So now fraternity of people. Don't, we don't need nations, we don't need nation states. We can erase the borders. We don't need the borders anymore. Why do you, okay, so this is, actually what is underlying the European approach to Israel as some kind of a nation state which remained in the past while we move forward to erase mm. the nation. Another thing is, in Europe, there is a latent anti-Semitism, mm. uh, anti-Jewish uh, uh, sentiment, uh, uh, and this is something very uh, deeply rooted in European culture, in European views, uh, because of various reasons, 
connected to Christianity, connected to the makeup of the nation state in, in Europe, which needed an enemy, and the enemy was the Jew always, because he was there, and he looks different, and he behaves different way, and he has different uh, holiday. And so it was easy to blame the Jew, the other, as the demon uh, who we all should uh, 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 unite against him. So now it is transferred to Israel. What was the, then the Jew in Europe, now the Jew in the Middle East. So uh, this also is added uh, to this. The third thing is that the discourse of identify, uh, the identifying with the underdog, which today is the name of the game, especially in the media, in academic institutions, and in political corridors. Uh, the Jew is not anymore the underdog. Uh, Europe more or less erased the Holocaust. Europe does not want to remember the Holocaust. It is too much of a burden. It's too heavy of a cross to carry what they did, what the Europeans did to, to the Jews. And Sweden especially, a state which supported the German, the Nazi industry mm. with steel, with iron. Mm. Okay? So definitely Sweden had a a, 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 pa a part, a good part, in what was happening in Europe, and not from the good side of the of the coin. And taking the Swedish history, especially this history of taking part in the war in the way Sweden did it, by supplying iron to the Nazi uh, war machine, as they did, is a burden. Who wants to remember it? Mm. So it's easy now to show the Jew as the bad man in order to retroactively justify what we did with the Nazis. Mm. This, I think, to a large extent, uh, is one of the uh, untold uh, story about the Swedish attitude to the state of Israel. Mm. Because by showing Israel as the bad guy mm. justifies retroactively mm the role of Sweden mm. in the Second World War, and nobody can deny that people knew mm. about the extermination of Jews. As you just mentioned, Dr. Kedar, you, you just said that Sweden had an active role in cooperation with the Nazi regime uh, during Second World War. Today we see a distinctive, clear cooperation between Sweden as the democra democratic states that are promoting and funding and financing the, the so-called Palestinian Authority, the so-called Palestinian people. Um, what's your takes on that? Well, I think this is the outcome of uh, the sentiment, of the anti-Israeli sentiment, mm. uh, mostly. Mm. As if it's human rights, as if it's political freedoms, as mm. if, as if, as if. It's uh, uh, behind the scenes, it's uh, how to act against Israel because they all know that the Palestinian Authority actively, mm. openly acts against Israel. I'll give you a good example. Uh, uh, the, 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 the PA uh, produces this uh, scarf, which uh, you know people go around in, in demonstrations, and and this is by by the PA. Okay, you see the the flag, the Palestinian flag. It's not Hamas. So on this side they said Akud Slana, mm. means Jerusalem is theirs. Since when Jerusalem is theirs? Mm. When was Jerusalem any capital of anything which is connected to the uh, Arab or the Islamic world? Mm. This one on, on one side. And on the other side which they show is Palestine. And, and this is the whole country. Palestine. So where is Israel? That's, that's mad, that's uh, crazy. So, so where is Israel? Yeah. They actually want Palestine on the whole space of Israel because this is the Mediterranean, this is the Jordan River. So where is Israel? It's there vanished? Is... Have, have it totally disappeared? This is the Palestinian Authority? No, no Israel, it's, it's Palestine. Yeah. Palestine. So where is Israel? They don't even mention Tel Aviv, only Yafo. Okay, so, so the, this is the dream. Yeah. And, and now you tell me that the Swedish do not see this? Mm. Actually, a uh, uh, little comment. Uh, it was a ceremony a couple of months ago where the head of uh, 
the Swedish monarch, the queen and the king of Sweden, actually got a gift from the Palestinian movement, the so-called Palestinian movement, and they got two uh, similar kafiyas with the same content. So what did they ask them about this? Where is Israel? They did not, not ask at all, and, and this is a big concern for us, to, to just uh, ask where is Israel? I think, I think that uh, somebody who honors himself mm. would ask him immediately, mm. if, if this is Palestine, where is Israel? Yeah. And if he doesn't, if he failed to show where is Israel, I think he would, should have given it back. Mm. This is propaganda. Mm. And, and more than propaganda, this actually shows what the dream is. Mm. The dream is not to live side by side with Israel. Mm. The Palestinian, over, overwhelmingly, mm. the PLO, never mind, Hamas, uh, definitely also, also Hamas, but it's uh, crossing mm. uh, parties, and factions, mm. they want to establish a Palestinian state on the ruins mm. of Israel. Mm. Now they cannot take Israel, so they take it slice by slice. Mm. Taking part, another part, another part. And, and they learn from Hezbollah in mm. Lebanon mm. that the terror pays and Israel runs away, mm. as Israel ran away from southern Lebanon mm. and created another Hezbollah land. In, in Lebanon in 2000. Mm -hmm. So the Palestinians learned from Hezbollah and they are trying now to do with the terror, mm -hmm. the same thing. But the terror failed. So now they do it with Swedish money mm -hmm. and another uh, European money and unfortunately American money as well. Of those who do not understand the nature of the Palestinian uh, 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 PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, mm -hmm. which talks about liber liberating Palestine entirely, mm, mm. regardless of Israel. They don't see Israel. So, so we could see a clear demonization and, and, and a process of the legitimization of, of the state of Israel and the Jewish people, and of course of the Zionist movement, uh, from the, the Muslim and Arabic uh, front. But we could see a clear uh, threat from inside the Jewish camp, the Israeli camp, or, or we have ideologically on the left side, the left wingers, uh, as Jews, as Israelis, they are promoting a Palestinian, so-called Palestinian statehood on Israeli soil, as the West Bank call it, the, the, the West Bank. Uh, actually, the accurate definition is, is uh, Judea and Samaria, as, as we know. But uh, what is your... How could you? How could we educate these people so they could orient or at least walk on the the, the correct and and the proper path of, of understanding the legitimate, the legal foundation of the state of Israel? Well, unfortunately, within us there are people who gave up on the struggle, and they are trying to find a way how to appease the alligator, mm. hoping that he will eat them last. And this is actually what happens here. Uh, people think, naive, naive people think that if you only give them this and only give them this and only give them this, it will satisfy them and they will leave you alone yes. forever and ever. This is not the nature of the Middle East. The Middle East, once you got something, now you go to the, to the other hill. You got this, you got you know, another one. You never give up. And struggles in the Middle East can last forever. Look, like the side between the Sunnis and the Shia, who are, it was for 14 centuries. They are fighting on, normally, you know, on, on the legacy of Muhammad. Oh, okay, so this is the Middle East. You, you can never finish a struggle. Yeah. There will always be somebody who will shake the boat, will undermine the, the agreement, and will continue the jihad. How can they, how, how can they uh, uh, assure it? Look, even if we came to terms with the this, with this Syrian regime, and we gave him the Golan, and we had peace mm. with Assad. Now, when the, all the jihadists are taking Syria, who will guarantee this uh, peace agreement if we had such an agreement? And when Assad will have to run away one day, if his head continue to be connected to his shoulders, which is another question. So, uh, you know, peace in the Middle East is something which is not achieved by, uh, by an agreement. Peace in the Middle East is something which is achieved by deterrence. Mm. When people leave you alone because you are too dangerous and you are too powerful and you are ready to use your power. And this is when peace comes to the Middle East because people 
leave you to live in peace. Mm. Peace is given only to the invincible. Mm. Because he is invincible, as, and, and, and this peace will last as long as he is being viewed as invincible. Mm. Not because he is nice, and not because he, he gave concessions. On the contrary, if he nice and he gives concessions, his is weak, mm. and weakness arouses the willingness to take him and to throw him to the sea altogether. So this is why source of peace in the Middle East is to be strong and to deter the others that they should better deal with their own business and leave you alone. Thank you for a very well covered answer, uh, Dr. Kedar. Uh, and if we just keep going on, I would like to ask you, we were touching this issue before, but what is your message to European decision makers and political leaders in Brussels and in the entire European Union uh, regarding uh, a very co controversial topic that not many people actually are aware of uh, when it comes to humanitarian, so-called humanitarian aid to the Palestinian people. Uh, we don't have any transparency. We've been uh, asking Swedish humanitarian uh, agency about where does the money go to? Uh, does it actually reach to the so-called Palestinian people or Will it actually go to the, to the pockets of, of, of Abu Mazen and, and Mahmoud Abbas? And his sons. And his sons and his family and uh, the, the Palestinian leaders' pockets. Since we actually seen a clear corruption scandals, not one, not twice, several within the Palestinian leadership. Uh, what is your message? How could we stop this uh, terrible way of, of, of stealing money from European states, tax money, and, and where, where the money goes directly to funding uh, terrorism towards Israelis and, and Jews from the Muslims, from the Islamic radicalists, from the so-called Palestinian uh, fronts? Well, first of all, these things have to be exposed. And whenever people expose what happens with the money and the more functioning of the m money in, in the Palestinian Authority, people are concerned, especially in Europe, and recently, there are some states in Europe which reduce mm. the support to the Palestinian Authority because of the corruption, because of the unclarity of uh, what happens with the money. And the EU, or Europeans also need the money. Secondly, there is a big problem with money which goes to the so-called refugee camps, uh, which actually are designed to blackmail the conscience of the world. Those refugees are refugees only for 70 years, for four generations. According to the international definition of refugees, they are not refugees anymore. Because the international uh, definitions of refugees are up to 10 years, as they are in the charter of the UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Up to 10 years, they cannot uh, give the refugee to the children. It's uh, received only the ones. And once they have a citizenship of any state in the world, they are not refugees anymore. Uh, okay, now, the Palestinian refugees in Jordan, for example, are citizens of Jordan. So how can they be, how can they be refugees and citizens? Um, now, many of those refugees, and the Palestinians also, are not originally Palestinians. They carry names like Hoani, which testifies they came from Syria, Al-Masri, means from Egypt. Mm. Masarwa, the same thing. Al-Horani, uh, al Sorani, from Tyre in Lebanon. al, al uh, Dibini, uh, Tarabulsi, means came from all these places in Lebanon. And many of the Palestinians are not originally Palestinians. Those refugees went back to the countries which they came here in order to work here in the Jewish uh, towns and villages which were, erected, which were created here since the last quarter of the 19th century. Just like they go today to Sweden and to Norway and to France and to, and, and to Spain. So, so, so basically uh, we could actually declare that uh, geo-historically uh, we never had a Palestinian people. Never. Never. Mm. We had a Palestinian people. Just like we didn't, never had a Jordanian people mm. or a Syrian or a Lebanese people. Mm. These are all new uh, states which we created uh, during the 40s of the last uh, century, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there are peoples. They were all shamis. This was the region mm -hmm. for, for
for uh, thousands of years. Yeah. So all of a sudden there is a, a people. Now, many of the Palestinian refugees are refugees who moved from their places uh, before 1948, uh, like 10 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So how can they be refugees in their own country? Only because their brothers keep them in refugee camp. The, ref, the, 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 Palestinian refu the Palestinians are keeping Palestinians mm. as refugees in refugee camps mm. near uh, Nablus. Uh, what is this? Why should this? Why should this be supported? They should tell them, hey, they are your brothers. Why do you keep them in, in refugee camps? And I'm talking since 1948. Mm. Now, 48, the war which created uh, supposedly this uh, this uh, uh, pro this problem actually was a war which was waged on Israel by seven Arab states one day after it declared its independence one single day so who is responsible for the creation of the of the uh, refugees problem the Arab countries which invaded this country made the war and they ran away from the war so they should solve the problem if they are the responsible what is, Israel should solve a problem which they created they should be responsible for what they do but the problem is that Arabs in many cases and in many areas do not feel responsibility for the problems which they create hmm. including the Palestinian refugee problem hmm. so the world should support it hmm. the world should have told them many years ago that decades ago to dismantle UNRWA hmm. the United Nations uh, agency which takes it over of the only the Palestinian hmm. refugees from the whole world only Palestinian refugees should dismantle it, should take the money for better causes mm. and absorb their brothers mm. in any Arab state because they are Arabs, they are Muslims, most of them, and they should be absorbed, especially in the countries which they came originally from, like Syria, the Hoanis, Egypt, the, 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 the Masri, and all these. So definitely the Palestinian refugees should not be a problem for decades already. Mm. But the problem is that the European money mm. keeps this problem alive mm. and they made their refugeehood into a profession mm. and the Europeans actually help them mm. be a professional refugees mm. and make big money out of this refugeehood mm. why should they work why should they be good they get out everything for free mm. so so if we're gonna still look at what's going on in Middle East, we have uh, a tremendous effect of, of, of Israel when it comes to the so-called Iranian issue. Uh, and uh, we consider, many consider the, the Iranian threat as the biggest threat to, to the state of Israel's existence, actual existence, the Jewish people's existence. Could you just brief us more about, under the, the headline, the, the biggest threat to, to the Jewish state of Israel? Well, it is correct that Iran, especially when it becomes nuclear, and nobody can stop it to, mm. as to today, uh, is a threat to Israel. But the problem is that Iran is not a threat only to Israel. Mm. Iran is a threat to Europe, no less than Israel. Mm. Their, all their missiles reach Sweden. Mm. Why do they need missiles which reach Sweden? Mm. The, Sweden is three times the the distance from Iran, like this, mm. why do they need these missiles? Mm. Uh, this is one thing. Secondly, they have submarines, which they know already how to launch missiles from the mass submarines. If they have nuclear warheads on these submarines, they will control the world from the Atlantic, from the Pacific, from wherever they can put those submarines in. So definitely, Sweden might be closer to the Iranian missiles than Israel. So why do why do the leaders, political leaders of, of the establishment of Europe, totally are they blind or have they covered their eyes for the reality when it comes to the Iranian threat? Since it's not only a, a huge, tremendously uh, uh, imperative threat to to Israel and and of course other states in Middle East, uh, but in real in the real case we have a huge threat to the surrounding uh, environment, and of course, Europe as well, and even to US. How could well, we deal with this issue? Well, as we already learned from Liza Minelli and Cabaret, mm. money makes the world go around. Mm. And today, 
Iran is a source of big money mm. to the industry, mm. industries mm. of Europe. Mm. And European uh, um, companies are maintaining big pressure mm. on the European governments mm. to open the gates to Iran because they want to get the contracts, the oil contracts and other contracts in, in Iran because Iran is big money. And they don't look at the security problems, not to mention Israel problems, but I even the European security, they, do, they, they don't care so much because they care to their shareholders and the workers. And they need jobs and they need the income. So unfortunately, what pushes Europe, including Sweden, I believe, to bed again with the Iranians is the money. And let the security go to hell. Who cares about security of Europe and Israel is alike? Well, it's a very terrifying scenario we could, we could face in front yes, of those us. Those Ayatollahs consider Israel, Jews in Israel as infidels mm. no less than the Europeans mm. as Christians or atheists. Mm. And they are even worse mm. so in, in this because they are atheists. Mm. So uh, this is why, at the end of the day, the Ayatollahs will target Europe after Israel, mm. right after Israel. Israel is, it will be the first course. Mm. Europe will be the main course. Mm. Perfect. And um, when it comes to um, our organization, Swedish-Jewish Dialogue, that serves as the only independent pro-Israeli organization, NGO, and a Zionist movement that serves as uh, a public diplomacy organization, we basically want to promote Israel and, and balance the negative aspect that media is portraying and actually put in more positive aspects and, and educate people, organization, political leaders, the mainstream, which have a, a extremely negative picture and perception about Israel. And, and our goal is actually to, to change this destructive pattern. Uh, what is your uh, takes on how we could change our aspirations a bit more so they become more receivable for all, for the audience? Well, first of all, I must say that organizations like this, and there are many in the United States, in Canada, and other countries as well, are the organizations which give us Israelis the strength to stand in front of the problems in the Middle East. We know that out there in Europe, in other places of the world, there are people who support us, Jews, Jewish people and non-Jews as well. Mm. And they usually cooperate in order to save Israel, to promote its cause, and to push aside all the anti-Jewish sentiments and anti-Israeli sentiments which there are in the media, in the academic uh, uh, circles, and political corridors as well. Mm. And we, you have no idea how much we Israelis are thankful to organizations like this, uh, which uh, actually are the mouth, uh, the, the voice for the voiceless, because we don't speak Swedish, we don't speak Norwegian, we don't speak uh, other uh, local uh, uh, languages. Mm. So definitely we, we depend on local people like you uh, uh, to be our real ambassador, uh, not to the prime minister, mm. but to the journalist, to the academic, to uh, people who who will correspond with you mm. and not with the ambassador of Israel. Mm. And this is why the importance of these non-governmental non -government, non organizations, NGOs, is so important because it really reaches the places which we Israelis have no idea how to reach and how to talk to them. We can actually mm. talk to their pe those people in their own languages. Mm. So this is why this, these organizations are so important. And uh, it gives us the feeling that, the, that we are not alone mm. in the battle against the extremism, against the jihadism, mm. against the, all these waves which, which tear the Middle East, as, as we see today, to pieces. Mm. I understand. So uh, we uh, got this beautiful chance to sit here with you in, in Ramana in Israel. Uh, and hopefully we will see you around in Europe as well. Um, to our viewers, uh, Dr. Mordechai Kedar will hopefully uh, visit uh, Scandinavia for a more uh, educative tour 
uh, most of all to our political leaders, to our uh, campus organizations, uh, and hopefully by uh, Dr. Kedar's perception of how we could solve the issues in Middle East and how we could actually stand up for the only thriving democracy in the Middle East, which is Israel, we will hopefully find a better way to go. So, Ms. Dr. Kedar, I uh, thank you so much thank for you your time. Much. Thank you very much for what you do, and thank you very much for what you are. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you.